Okay. Okay. Hey, let's uh, let's get started. So, a um, couple things, a couple announcements before we go. We ready? Yo, laptops away. Um, so first off, a couple of announcements. World of Conversation Block 2 has started, so if your name begins with F or M, uh, be looking for the email and make sure you check your spam folder. Second, uh, the, there is a class reflection assignment that is mandatory for everybody from the day of the exam. That's last Thursday. But you don't have to write three essays, you just have to write one. And, and this is to earn your two attendance points. Well, you don't, you don't have to do it because you don't have to earn the two attendance points. It's due on Thursday at 3 p.m. Next, uh, go ahead. Um, so we have five guests with us today. I'm going to do, we're, I'm going to have them introduce themselves and then we're going to do the attendance quiz and then we're going to have class. And I'm really looking forward to class. Five, how would I say, esteemed guests, colleagues of mine, uh, and one who, who's more than a colleague. Uh, and so, yeah, why don't you introduce yourselves and then I'll talk about how it is that you got, should we start with you? Let's start with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, first off, this is Lori, who you met one time in class, but. Really, was I here this semester? Yeah, you start, I thought it was. Anyway. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah I was okay. here. In the, yes. You were. Lori Mulvey, Dr. Yes. Lori Mulvey, my wife and my, uh, my former boss, actually, so go ahead. <laughs> I don't know what else I'm going to say. <laughs> So I know what I'll say. So yes, I'm the director of World and Conversation, which you all get to be part of. But more importantly, I've watched this person uh, do Social 19, lead Social 19 for multiple, many decades, actually. Many And so decades. it's very interesting to see groups of, groups of students year after year after year. So, um, and I'm gonna be assessing how well he does today, so. And I'll be assessing how well you do okay. today because that's why you're here, to <laughs> awesome. do what you do. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bassem. I come to you from Iraq. I've been a friend uh, with Sam for 12 years. This is my fifth time in person here, yeah, I think. It's yeah, my yeah. fifth time in person here. And uh, happy to be here. And Bassem is more than, a f Bassem is my Iraqi brother. So, yes. Yeah, so uh, hi everybody, I'm Camilla. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the War Studies University in Warsaw, Poland, where we also uh, have the dialogues with World in Conversation, and I train civilian and military students in cross-cultural competence, gender awareness, all the soft skills. Hi everyone, I'm Julie. Some of you know me because we had a lot of interactions <laughs> through the staff email. Um, I come from Colombia. I'm a sociologist and I'm also a global partner, partner of World in Conversation back home. So some of you have had conversations with students from Colombia. Um, yeah, so happy to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. If you have any problems with the class, talk, talk to Julie after class. She's willing to answer <laughs> any questions. Not today. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Igor Asaf, and I'm from Brazil and I am a sociologist too. I used to teach sociology and methodology in uh, universities in Brazil and I'm a partner of Word in Conversation since 2017 or 2018 I think. It's good to be here. It's really, it's really good to have you and in particular Igor and Camilla, this is your first time in the classroom, though Camilla has been on the stream a number of times, yeah. It's, uh, 
Yeah, it's really, really nice to have you. We're, we're having a gathering, a global gathering with World in Conversation, and so that's how they ended up here. And I said, look, you gotta come into class because we have to talk about some things. Let's just do the quiz first off, and then we'll get started with class. So, um, Okay, we good? Hey, um, okay, let's go to the first slide. So today, I'm calling today's class, and, and I'm, I'll mostly speak to you all, because you're, you need to, you're going to be the, the folks that are commenting on this, and, and, and I'm really happy to have you here to talk about this issue, because uh, it, is, it is an issue that, r is, that it requires uh, both a perspective from inside the United States and outside the United States, because I know in your countries you're dealing with some variation of this also. So there's a great replacement theory or hypothesis that is rooted in what would be, what, what, we, what is argued here, so the way, the way this is seen in the United States is that it's argued that this thesis or way of seeing the world is rooted in a racist trope. And the racist trope, so this is the way it's seen, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that that's what this is, but that's the way it's seen. And the racist trope is related to this idea that white people are always or should always be afraid, white people, the more advanced, the more elevated cultures should always be afraid of less advanced cultures taking over. So you always want to be on the lookout for people who are coming behind, who are going to really move in and somehow take power. And you don't want that because those people, those people, black and brown people, generally speaking, are not seen as advanced as people who are white, okay? So the idea is that there is a conspiracy happening relative, related to our immigration policies especially with respect to refugees, but the immigration policy, the, the conspiracy is that politicians in the United States who, there are certain groups of politicians who are secretly trying to change the demographic makeup of the United States so that the United States becomes more black and more brown because these particular group of politicians know or they think that support for them and their policies mostly comes or is going to come from black and brown people and especially black and brown immigrants. So if we can bring more black and brown people in the United States and those black and brown people support my policies and the things that I represent and who I am and therefore my power, then I sh can bring, I should change the makeup of the United States, especially if I'm white and I'm conservative because I'm increasingly on the mi in minority status, okay? So the great, re great replacement theory is rooted in conspiracy that this is going on. And in the United States, it's going on on the part of the Democratic Party and liberals, okay? So, so, if you look at this, 43% of the votes for Biden in 2020 came from black, Hispanic, and Asian voters. Like that is, that means that's a lot of people, that's a lot of votes. And Biden needs more votes in order to win. 
And so the Democratic Party should rally around black people and brown people who are more likely to vote for the Democratic Party. So if we can bring more of them into the United States, this would be really good. So secretly, remember, it's a conspiracy. So secretly, this is what's behind the immigration policy. So when you think about Mexico and the immigration crisis at our borders and immigrants coming from the Middle East and who we let in this country, People behind the scenes are conspiratorially moving things around, changing the levers so that this happens. So next slide. Uh, so, so this is a quote from a, a, a uh, I didn't even put the name up there because it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but Biden intentionally let Afghanistan fall Afghanistan fall, let it happen so that we want all these Afghans to come to the United States. Now this is being stated, these kinds of things, more and more on mainstream media, not just locked away in the dark corners of the dark web, but on mainstream media, people on talk shows and people talking back and forth and saying these things. That's what this came from. Okay, it was like a, somebody said, said it on CNN or Fox News or something like that, okay? Um, so here's the racial makeup, if you think just the planet. People of European ancestry are 16% of the world's population. Now some of these Latinos, right, some of these Latinos are naturally going to be white, but people of European ancestry primarily are 16% of the population which means that the world is very black and very brown. And it will continue to get more black and brown because people who are white, generally speaking, except in certain areas, generally speaking, have very low birth rates. Okay, so there's a thing thinking about this. Okay, go to the next one. Um, this is not a new thing. This is a cartoon from 1881. In the United States, there have always been these ideas of that politicians are going to let immigrants into the countries who will support those politicians. So just in the United States, this, do you, know, do you have any idea? That's, so that's a, a monkey. It's a chimpanzee, gorilla, monkey, kind of a mix of them. Who, do, you know, does any, do, you, do you have any idea who that represents in the U.S. in 1881? who that would be, what immigrant group? Do you, do you have a sense? Julie, what do you think? It says Irish. What's it? It says Irish. Yeah, the, it's the Irish, right? Yeah, 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 because here it's the Irish world, right? Yeah. So it's, this, how, this is how the Irish were. Go to the next one. Irish American, dynamite. Here, this is Uncle Sam. This is Teddy Roosevelt. These are the, the rats, the immigrants from Italy. And they were perceived to be supporting of certain presidential candidates in the United States. But, but the immigrants from Italy are a bad idea if you're not part of that political party. So what we're talking about with the great replacement theory, and now that I've said it, now that you're aware of this, if you haven't heard it before, you're going to hear it more and more. 1903, next slide. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you some numbers. The recent change, read this, right? The recent change, this was a poll that was done here in, in the United States just recently. And the demographic makeup is not natural, but it's been motivated by progressive liberals who are actively trying to leverage their power by replacing conservative white voters with black and brown immigrants and residents who will vote for them and their political parties. This is big. So think in your minds, like how many Americans support this? Like what's, what's your sense? How many, what, what percentage of Americans do you think support this? Just like in your minds, like think, like huh. That's like, wow, okay. So go ahead. So look at Republicans. That's two out of three people who vote Republican, two out of three. Like you, you think of the implications of this. If this is happening, what it means, and Democrats and independents, even with Democrats, it's one out of three. I mean, this is, okay. Um, so here, go to the next slide, let's. Uh, so, Lori Lynn, 
So you are here. One, one quick question. Okay, yes. yeah, say that and then I'll yeah, say. You are here as a co-facilitator and you and I are going to ask questions and that is your expertise. So go ahead. Just before a question, I just wanted to say the frame or at least one frame of the conversation that you shared with me, yep. which might be helpful, which is that um, when you bring Social 19 students to the front of the room to have a conversation. You don't bring them up as experts, yep. but as people who are going to talk about a topic. Uh, and yes. I just wanted to reinforce that this was also, Sam also told me that this was also meant to be not a panel of experts, yeah. but a panel of humans <laughs> who are just, you're asking them off the cuff, as we say, to talk about something that's on, on the agenda today. So Camilla and Bossom didn't have any idea what we were going to talk about until just before class. Um, Julie and Igor, I gave them just a little heads up so they could think about it because I thought the situation in Brazil and Colombia merited, and also because they're both sociologists. So I was like, okay, let me give the sociologists a head start. You know? Well, that's not fair. <laughs> no, <laughs> are you kidding me? I always need a head start. Okay, so, you know, all right. <laughs> I'm just following <laughs> myself. So, uh, so, so you, you all are not experts. But you know, from what I would say is your sociological address, now this is a term that we have used before in class. Lori developed this term and- With our team at with World in Conversation. Team and say what it means, because this so, is good. So sociological address is, I always have to give an example. A lot of us are familiar with intersectionality, right? We're, and that's two variables coming together, like white woman, um, I don't know. Indian Christian, two variables, two variables. But sociological address, really, we see it as a matrix of va variables, right? Because none of us are two things. We're all many things, including just where we grew up, right? If I grew up in the mountains of Pennsylvania, that's different than growing up in the desert of Arizona, whatever. The point is, sociological address is sort of where you're geolocated uh, on the planet. It's not how you think about yourself, it's not identity, it's literally, what are all the factors that make up you? Dude, it's brilliant, by the way. So, it really is, it, it is like a, it is a concept that I've searched my entire life for. And when you came home that one day with it, I just was blown away. It, it's, it's very, so given your sociological address, addresses, okay, and what you see, um, what comes to mind when you think about how many Americans, first off, you think about this thesis that there's a whole sector of American politicians who are secretly organizing American life to change the, the demographic makeup of the United States. Like, just what off the top of your head comes to mind from what you see from where you live? That's a really wide open question. So you can go in many, many different directions and then we can narrow it down. I just want to see if anything comes up. Yeah. yeah, like what comes up to my mind as a for a person who is working in the military, and you know, the military is usually like you know, Klaus of it said, politics done by other means. Um and what is our um our uh take on politicians? Like we've all seen House of Cards, right? And this is also sometimes what we in the military uh, and in mainstream Polish society perceive that we will never are going to know what's really going on. All we can do is just, you know, stand there, shoot or stand there and vote. So even in the military, there's this idea of like that you, you never know what's going on with politicians. I mean, uh, of course, not everybody thinks like that, yeah. if, but that's pretty popular among especially soldiers of lower ranks. Yeah, okay. So that is like, you know, you never know what's really going, out, uh, going on up there. So that means that, and what you're saying is, is true in Poland, that means like kind of anything could be a conspiracy. Anything could be happening. So even, even something like this, that you know, the Biden team and Democrats are secretly saying like, hey, we don't like these conservative white Christians. So here's what we do. We can't change their thinking, 
but what if we bring all these black people from Africa and Asian people from Southeast Asia and Latinos and Mexicans from Mexico and people from the Middle East and Afghan Muslims from the Middle East and like what if we bring them in and then we'll like somehow convert them to our side that can make sense to people since they don't know yeah I mean uh, in Poland actually we do have uh, this um refugee, not really crisis, but a huge influx of refugees uh, due to the war uh, in Ukraine. And it's actually friends of mine who are educated, like, you know, university educated. And uh, one time, I, and she, my friend, my best friend, she's not alone in this, trust me. And she comes over and she says, you know, let's connect the dots. So there are all those, <laughs> yeah, and like, you know, she says, uh, so we have right now two millions of uh, Ukrainian refugees that are living and working in Poland for the last two years. Um, and they are given the um, child benefits, free uh, schools, not because of some biopolitical conspiracy, but simply because this is something that, like, you know, our, our government did in support. However, she said, connect the dots, you know. After five years, they're going to get citizenship, and then they are going to go vote again for the government that gave them all this. Huh? So that is, you know, and to me, I understand if somebody just simply uh, not educated and um, yeah, would go with that, but that's somebody who has a university degree. So, but, but even if they are educated, you still don't know what's really going on. I don't know what's going on in, in the White House, so like even there. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just wanted to um, de-emphasize the conspiracy part of it because it's only a conspiracy it seems to me that we only call it a conspiracy if we don't think it's true <laughs> right so it's a ah. it's an assumption or it's a theory or it's a conclusion that you've come to so I just want to keep talking about this idea as as if as an idea as a hypothesis it's a hypothesis is what you said so you don't have to okay we're, we're high-fiving <laughs> we are high-fiving right there thank you for that Angelica like that yeah Okay, so, but Julie, you were going to say. Yeah. So, first thing, um, I think it's a, a really well done narrative because it kind of makes sense at some point, you know, like even if you don't trust it, it can be true. Yeah. I think it's a well done narrative, like well structured, well spread across the globe, and now because, I mean, across the country. Now, because we have today ways to do it, um, and also, we have kind of evidence that that happened before, like the Spanish, when they came to America, they kind of replaced indigenous culture and they just start with different motivations, I guess they were not thinking about voting because that was another system. Um, so why not? Why not believe in that? Uh, so I think it's a well done narrative. Yeah. Well, yeah that's yeah. one of the things. Um, I'm not saying that I, I believe it's truth, but I, I, I can see the potential of why people is believing in that because it's well structured. Um, another thing is, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking in immediately back home when not this, this, election, this past elections, but uh, our former government, government uses the same structure, well done, well spread, and just motivated uh, for elections. And they were saying that we will become Venezuela because we had a lot of immigrants from Venezuela coming to Colombia. And they say, like, if you allow to come Venezuelans, they will become citizens, they will vote against, and then now we that was like the right wing and now we have the left wing in the government and they have they, they were right they said like okay you see that right uh, wing left is uh, in colombia because you allowed so much people to come here and vote with them so now they have the chance to win the next elections because they're like st they're becoming strong with that narrative so I, i'm just seeing the yeah. The potential yeah, yeah. of the narrative. And your, and your left-wing government now that's currently in power was not voted into power with the help of all of these Venezuelan refugees because they didn't vote, right? They didn't vote. But they once didn't. they get the ability to the vote, 
then you assume that they're all going to be on the left because they're from Venezuela, even though not everyone on the left and on, in Venezuela is on the left, but the yeah. assumption is, yeah. and so they will go in that direction. Okay. Uh, and let me see. Let me say this about. It's just like side point, side yeah. comment about the left in Latin America. I think left is like two steps to the right. right. <laughs> it's not left <laughs> at all. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Fossil, um, you will go forth here. Okay. No, go okay. ahead, Igor. Thank you. Uh, I also heard that the difference between uh, fiction and reality is that fiction it must have sense, make sense. So uh, I think that we have this... Wait, can you say that again? Uh, the difference between fiction and reality... Fiction and reality. It's that fiction uh, must make sense. <laughs> 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 so uh, I think with the, we have this need to make sense of uh, the things that are seen in the world. As Camila, uh, uh, Camila's friend told, oh, let's connect the dots. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, in the lunchtime today, we were speaking about Zodiac stuff. And for me, this is uh, the, the same thing. Oh, look at the stars. Let's connect this. Uh, this is a tower. This is a bull. This is a, a, <laughs> a Sagittarian. I don't know. It's, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a PC, uh, a fish. Oh, come on. The, the, don't make sense. We are trying to connect dots that aren't actually connected. So uh, as we are trying to figure out our reality, make sense of it, uh, we, we have this need to believe in something, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be something good for us. Yeah. It yeah, had, yeah. Uh, it had Igor, just to be structural. Oh, what, make, what makes you think that in this case, this isn't true? I, I hear what you're saying okay. about it doesn't have to, like reality doesn't have to fit all the dots, but what makes you think this hypothesis isn't true from what you see? Uh, because uh, as I study sociology and history um, along those all those years uh, usually uh, there isn't actually people on control of nothing people usually take uh, <laughs> take decisions based on something uh, that individually makes sense but uh, as conspiracy theorists they need to have a sense on a global scale mm -hmm. usually yeah. it's pretty hard this thing to to uh, actually, uh, does uh, you have this much people involved in something and hide it for everyone, from everyone? Come on, it's. I oh know. I heard that someone that was there, and he told me that they met and they choose to do this. Who? Oh, someone that <laughs> have a blog in the internet, <laughs> you know. So I I uh, receive it in my WhatsApp. It's like that. And there it is. Yeah. Awesome. Wait, he just held the conspiracy line strong. And I'm going to go back to the non-conspiracy line in a second. But Bassam, what, what do you see in Iraq? Like, you have so many refugees in Iraq. What are people uh, saying? Well, Sam, before I go to say what I have on my mind, I'm going to ask you a question. When do you think this idea of bringing immigrants to the States to affect the outcome of politics started? Uh, from the very first arrivals from Europe to the United States. And do, you think, first one. do you think it has increased in our time? Uh, I think the, the impact, what, has, immigration or you mean? The, immigration, uh, immigration. It, yeah, we're, we're, see, we're seeing more pressures, but you know, the numbers of immigrants, like the numbers of refugees, let's say, in the United States, mm -hmm. we're really down on the list. We're okay. way down on the list. Yeah. So um, when I came from Istanbul, there was about 50 people from Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were in groups. And when I arrive, arrived at Dulles Airport, there was the IOM waiting for them. IOM is the International Organization of Migration. And I thought that this group of immigration has stopped. I was really surprised to see 50 people being uh, received in DC with the IOM. I was very surprised. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and now yeah, let's. And 
50, it seems like a lot on a That's plane. That's a lot of number on the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I was really surprised to see this number. So let's go back to Iraq. Iraq has uh, seen migration in phases. Uh, in my lifetime, I can say it started in the 80s with the Iranian-Iraq war. Mm -hmm. For eight years, so many people migrated to the United States, mainly. The second phase started in 1991, that's after Iraq invaded Kuwait. Uh, and the sanctions started, and uh, when there was hardship, and uh, university professor salary would not be more than ten, fifteen dollars a month, so a lot of scholars left Iraq. And the third migration was after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. That's where we witnessed migration of uh, scholars, Christians, uh, and uh, minority groups. First, the rich were able to leave Iraq, the poor went into the Kurdistan area, and the last and the worst migration was in 2014 when ISIS took over Mosul. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody who, had, who was able to leave Mosul, that's, that, this will be uh, internal migration, not external migration. Mm -hmm. So for Iraqis, it was so easy. A friend of mine who I'm visiting in two weeks, uh, he left Iraq and uh, in three months he was able to get immigration status to the United States. So it was so easy in the 90s to get immigration. Now it's not easy, it's difficult now. But I think it was facilitated for a certain amount of group of Iraqis to come mm -hmm. to the United States. So, so easy. Certain groups, right? certain groups, which is usually what happens. By yeah. the way, like you said, here we had an airplane full of Africans, right? Fifty Africans yeah. from, I'm assuming, sub-Saharan Africa, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So they they probably were. It took many years or a long time to process them, process them, and then they became a single group and came together. So it seems like a lot, but but in Iraq. You now, you have a lot of refugees in Iraq currently because of this, the war and with We're Syria still, and yeah. how are, do Iraqis say a similar kind of thing as this? Like are Iraqis really trying to wait, trying to find a way to understand these refugees? Well, uh, we, we, would, we don't like to call them refugees, I, okay, but the Syrians, the Syrians who left Syria went into Turkey. Now Turkey, they kicked them out. So every Syrian who was in Turkey and who cannot return back to Syria is now is in Iraq. Uh, they are refugees. They cannot find yeah. a job. They are uh, living bad uh, living situations. And uh, we really hate to call them refugees, but they are refugees. And do, and do Iraqis speak? How many, what percentage of Iraqis that you know, that you're aware, really don't want them? Like, you know, really? Well, I will tell you who doesn't want them. I, the young the young who are losing their jobs mm -hmm. because of the Syrians taking over the job because the Syrian would say work for $200 a month while an Iraqi would not work for less than 500 a month. So the Iraqi youth mm -hmm. are uh, not happy with them in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Do you, so the conflict, this refugee conflict is not just something here. I, this is what I really want to point out to people. This trying to understand, trying to balance immigration and the change and what is happening on a global perspective is not something that we're, only we are struggling with here in the United States. It's something that people are trying to manage all over the world. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you're familiar with where I am in Erbil, uh -huh. which is called Kurdistan. So, lived by the Kurdish people. And Kurdistan, their dream of having a country. So Iraq being South Kurdistan, Syria being West Kurdistan, Turkey being North Kurdistan, and the Kurds in Iran are considered East of Kurdistan. So the Kurds, they want these people in to increase the number of Kurds people in Iraq uh. to affect policies. Mm. Mm. How do we know that's not a conspiracy theory? <sighs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the how would we know? How would we know? I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to answer, yeah. but how would we know if what Bossom just said, right? How would we know if it was a conspiracy or why aren't we suggesting that it's a conspiracy? Yeah, <laughs> Igor, you know? you're like, hmm. Well, he, he, no, because uh, he said that uh, that's something that they want. Right. Oh, they want this because they're wanting something. Okay, that's not to be a conspiracy theory. You have to be. Uh, that has to be organization, uh, go, uh, reachable goal that makes sense in the um, in the part of it. Because uh, just wishful thinking. Ah, we wish that we could do that. For me, because I I don't get it as a conspiracy theory actually. Because yeah. uh, say that again. I, I, I don't uh, I don't see it as as, mm -hmm. as the way they put it as a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, a week ago, just before I came, uh, they discovered that about three hundred thousand Syrian Kurds have been given fake IDs so that they can be able to participate in elections in north of Iraq. So that is conspiracy. Ah, okay. They they and discovered them. them. The fake IDs must be the local government. Ah, yeah. So like, hey, we'll give you the fake IDs and you vote for us. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it was in the news, being right or wrong, I don't know, but it was in the news. So, okay, right. yeah. No, because uh, I just remember a documentary that I saw uh, uh, a long time ago. I think of, uh, about three, four years ago. It's called uh, Wild Wild Country. It's mm -hmm. about uh, uh, um, a group of uh, here in the United States. I don't remember which state it was, but a guru, an Indian guru came here and he bought a, a piece of land mm -hmm. and people showed up there to be there. So uh, it, it started to have some problems with the locals. Yeah. And uh, it, it would be holding the election. And what they organized it was to go to some uh, big cities that have a uh, homeless and put them in buses and bring to this place for them and register them for, for, to voting, to vote for for them. Uh -huh. So this case, it's uh, <laughs> it was recorded. Yeah. <laughs> it actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if is any of you have watched this this documentary. No, there was this guy. Wide, wide country. Rajneesh. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, but this is the thing, right? So listen, the reason, by the way, uh, the reason we're, we're, I decided to have this particular conversation The reason I decided to have this particular conversation today with them, because A, we were looking for a topic that just seemed like, how oh, was something that we could riff about, that we could just kind of talk about a little bit. And it's a, this is, this replacement theory is such a big issue here in the United States. It is growing into a really, really big issue and is going to be increasingly a central part of the political debate here in the United States. And so it's valuable to have an understanding of what it is and what it means. And once again, you're gonna hear about it because it's going to be talked about more and more. And now that we've talked about it, you know, like when you talk about something, you hear it, right? And you start to recognize it. Did you have a, did, it, and then I'm gonna go to you. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, like coming back to uh, what we were trying to figure out, like how, uh, what Laurie said, how do you know it is not a conspiracy theory? And nowadays in the post-truth uh, world, it's very difficult actually, simply because first of all, uh, okay, the easiest, uh, as Basim said, the easiest uh, way to fail, a, uh, to reveal a conspiracy theory is just to bring on facts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 
Yeah, but what are facts in the post-truth society? It's like you've got cognitive warfare, you've got, you know, all the, pro not really propaganda, but manipulation. You've got so many things going on and so many sources of information available to you mm -hmm. that you cannot really, I mean, okay, so maybe it's about the quantity. Right, so maybe the what majority believes and shares officially, even if it's uh, kind of like you know it's not true, that will be the official, and that would be considered the truth. And mm -hmm. something else would be mm -hmm. considered conspiracy theory, simply because it is upheld. Like you know, the narrative is bought by minority. And what if it's the other way around? So are we talking like, you know, what is the difference now? So here, so let me, uh, one thing that I think about when you say that is if two thirds of people who are voting Republican are thinking that the immigration policy of the Biden administration, which is not, which he doesn't even control, you know, the Congress, controls it along with the president. So the immigration policy of the Biden administration is an immigration policy that is centered around er the eradication, because I'll just call it that, because this is the words that people are using, the eradication of white people here in the United States. And so what we want to do is turn the population over to black and brown people and to Muslim people because the idea also that people are talking about is we're gonna bring in more and more Muslims because it is also a conspiracy against Christians. So what, does, what that means then when I look out you know, to, to think about the average American and I think, whoa, if I'm Christian, I'm afraid, right? If I'm Christian, I'm afraid. If I'm white, I'm afraid. And what I'm afraid of is that somebody up there in power, someone who I don't control and I don't know, somebody up there in power is making decisions that are not in my best interest and in fact are really going to harm me. And like, wow, man, what does that mean for me as a citizen like here in the United States? And what's it mean for the future of conflict between different groups in the United States. So I think about, Julie, I think about, hang on, I'm gonna get to your question in a second. I think about, again, I remember when the pandemic, when the pandemic hit in Bogota, and I remember Lori and I were in Bogota, if you remember, like right before the panic hit, and how there were more and more Venezuelans on the street. We couldn't, we would walk out of our apartment and we would go, one block and we would just immediately be met by Venezuelans asking for food, asking for things, right? No, we and would just bring things with us to give to Venezuelans because yeah. we knew, I mean, it was just like, uh, what clothes do we have? What food do we have? We would just, because we could expect to see homeless Venezuelans. Homeless Venezuelans. And then when the, when the, when the COVID hit, and all the Colombians, the book, uh, Colombians stayed inside their houses. The Venezuelans who were on the streets had no way to survive. Like they couldn't survive because they survived off of people who would give them money as they were asking for money. And it created such intense conflict between Colombians and Venezuelans when in fact you're really, in some ways, you're the same people, right? I mean, it's not different nationality, but it's the same, they're human beings, right? So I'm wondering about when I think about what this means for the, for the conflict of the future, I think about what you went through in, in Colombia at that time. Yeah. I, I think something, I, I was thinking before something, but you brought that uh, point of, of the Venezuelans, like poor people in the streets and so, and I, I think that we had kind of a conversation this morning about that. There's a, there's a piece missing here about immigration because it seems like we are assuming that those immigrants are, I mean, we're talking just about illegal immigration and poor people yeah, but migrating. But also, also legal immigration here. I'm, yeah. I'm going about to say oh, that, yeah, okay. like, yeah. 
How about people in Florida from Latin America starting businesses, big businesses, uh, having visas for working visas? Uh, I don't know where other countries are welcome to start businesses here, but there's a huge um, real estate market through from Florida to Latin America to come here, invest, have your have your get your visa, get your green card. So. Is that theory also afraid of that replacement with people who has money to go to the United ah. States and start something? Or are we just afraid of people? Or are, are the theory just afraid of people who doesn't have anything? Because that's a different conversation. Okay. Uh, uh, we're not talking about exactly of the action of going to from one country to another, but the way or even more, the type of people. It sounds mean and it's hard to recognize, but it seems like we choose who is okay to yeah, be here yeah. because they have something for us. Or, I mean, I'm just including in the society, but <laughs> just talking about the, the conspiracy. So it's, it's more about something else. Yeah, well, a lot of it, okay, a lot of it is, is about class, but in this particular case, it, for people who are thinking that the replacement, we, conservative white Christians, are being replaced by people who are not us. It doesn't matter to a degree in the face of it whether we're being replaced by rich people or poor people or whatever the case is, it doesn't really matter. How the do fact you that know? We're being, I mean, most, I'm just going by what the polls are saying, but in truth, we know that people are less afraid, Americans are less afraid of wealthy immigrants than they are of poor immigrants. And so, so one of the things we were talking, we came to, and we were having a conversation earlier this morning, not just us, but a group of us, and um, it didn't seem like the issues of immigration in the United States were so unique. And Sam shared some data this morning that the United States is actually like down below the 20th country in, in terms of who has the most migration into their country or the yeah. most refugees, yeah. right? So we're very low on the scale. So I think I, want, I wish we could just broaden out to what are the kinds of things, like you're saying some people in this country are saying, uh, are the, the trope is white people are gonna be replaced, right? Who are in other, in maybe in what you've seen where you live or around you, what are the, f are the, is there a similar, like, oh, these people are afraid that those people are going to replace them or that those people are going to take something away from their culture? Like, what would, here in this moment, what we're talking about is a white fear? Yeah. Can, wait, but, what are you doing? Are you? No, I just want to give an example of what you said, and then I want to, I want I, you to keep going. I was asking for examples. All right, go, go ahead. Yeah, what's the, what's the, you yeah, know, what's the, f so what's the fear? What's the what? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupt. I was I just wanting to. For, I didn't know you could see that. I thought you would only see it behind you. I didn't realize you could see that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Ask I was again. just asking, are there similar tropes about those people are going to do this to us, these people, in not white Americans and other people, Americans, but Poles and somebody, or ex-Poles and Northern Poles. Is there, do, do, do yeah. you see that? Like with Do all the Ukrainians, right? Uh, yeah, but we actually had that situation and we discussed this uh, today morning uh, as well. One of the reasons, as I told you, why uh, the Polish government denied uh, the um, the um, Middle Eastern refugees and African refugees uh, was simply because, uh, first of all, due to... Um, um, due to uh, the security situation, because they knew that our society is just not ready for, um, I mean, we're pretty xenophobic, we're like 94% uh, uh, percent of white Catholics, so our government knew that this might end bad also for the people, but secondly, uh, also there is a demographic crisis in Europe, Mm -hmm. And uh, the future doesn't look too bright for anybody in Europe who is simply uh, of, you know, the Caucasian uh, origin. Let's call it like this. Because you're uh, not having kids. Yeah, we're not. I mean, I am, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and I've got three, so I did my duty, you know. Uh, but um, but yeah, but the thing is that uh, the demographic growth uh, of non Caucasian, non Europeans is pretty impressive, and this is what our government also used to some extent. Ah, so so in other words, so what I'm hearing is, look, for, first off, if we go, can you actually go back? Go to that one graph, the circle graph. I just want, yeah, that one. First off, what, what, I, what I think about with the demographic crisis for you is, look, only 16% of the world is of European ancestry. So if you have a demographic crisis and you don't have workers, you understand, like, you have to have each, on, for a population to reproduce itself, each woman in that population, on average, has to have 2.1 children just to reproduce the population. And if you have less than that, that means the population is going to decline. And you can't have populations declining because the young people need to take care of the old people. So when you decline, that means everybody else who's older is not gonna have anybody to take care of them, to work with them, and to, to to keep the economy flowing. So that means when I think about this, I'm like, well, this is basically 84% of the world is not white. So that means every white society who has low birth rates is going to need to bring more and more black people and brown people into their society. You have to do that. It's going to happen. So like in Poland, for example, right now you have all these Ukrainians coming in who happen to be white, but you're gonna get black and brown people. Like, you're going to. So that makes me think about this replacement theory in a way it's like, we, there's, there's no conspiracy here. It's just like you're gonna have immigrants and they're gonna not be white. That's what it is. I That's wish, how it's gonna operate. Sam, can you, can you just repeat some part of that again? Because this is another thing that happened in our conversation this morning about immigration and migration and refugees was that we actually had to put population di dynamics next to it yeah. like we couldn't actually have the conversation if we didn't also talk about the the what is it Low, declining birth rates yeah. and so um and, and so what you just said i feel like it just bears repeating because there's so many assumptions that we have about that the birth rate is rising and the population, the planet is, it has too many people, there, these things, that, and, and that we have so many immigrants coming into the United States and these things are actually not happening in the way that we all assume. Yeah. So, for, so first off, like we're all, you all know, right, we do not have many immigrants coming into the U.S. relative to many other nations. I mean, we don't have high numbers of immigrants right now. So you, we're, where's that graph that you had this morning? Uh, it's on my phone. I but can't believe what we do. What we do right now, no, just in the past couple of years with the Biden administration, now we see the numbers really shot up. But if, but if we're, but that was 2023, that graph, I believe. Yeah, the clarifies, but that was just refugees. And so oh. the U.S. is way, way, way down on the list. We do not let many refugees into the United States. So... Uh, if, but we don't let, we have not let that many immigrants into the United States for decades, but right now we just happen to see a real increase, right? But, but I just want to say, and I am imagining yeah. that in this room of people, m many people yeah. do not understand what is happening with population, with birth rate declines, because I did not until recently understand what is this thing about what young people have to support older people? Yeah. Like, what is that about? Like, it doesn't seem right when you say it. So yeah. can you just say a little more about it? So here, listen, here, here get, get this. All right, hang on. Here's the population pyramid is like this. At the very top, I'll put my beads away. At the very top are old people. And then when you, get, you start going down the pyramid, it's younger and younger people. So down here, it's people who are newly born. And that's the pyramid that allows a nation to reproduce itself and to be strong. You need large numbers of people down here. And slowly they, grow, they die away. Wait, and why do you need lar large numbers of people at the bottom? Because you need people to take all the jobs that fuel the economy to make the economy work. If you only have, because at some point people retire. Like Lori and I, 
don't use us as examples. We're not at retiring. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just I, don't. No, hang on. No, no, it wasn't the retiring. Oh, one. okay. It's like, it was the young people. We don't have kids. Ah, uh, so apart. Lori needs to have 2.1 children. Every woman in this, if if every woman in this room, whatever nation you're from, on average, you need to have 2.1 children to reproduce the population of your nation. Lori and I didn't have any kids. That means another woman has to have 4.2 kids. In Camilla's world, women are having the, po the population, the fertility rate is higher than the United States because you're a Catholic nation, so it's like that's the nature, but it's still low. And in Korea, for example, has the lowest fertility rate in the world at 0.78. Korea cannot reproduce its population at all. They have a fundamental work crisis. They, they have nobody, they will soon have nobody to take all of the jobs that they need to have in Korea to take care of the Korean population. But not just the older people. Not just the older just people, to live. everybody. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have jobs. So that means you gotta go outside of society to bring people in who will take these jobs and make the economy really dynamic and, st and strong. And so as we're talking about this replacement theory, A, you gotta replace the workers that people like me and Lori are not making, since we didn't make any workers. We didn't figure out how to do that. So we didn't make any, so somebody else is gonna have to make them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so. Okay. It's not to keep the population at a certain level because of the numbers. It's literally to keep the economy moving. To keep the economy moving. going, mm -hmm. to keep things fueled, to make it happen. And so... so but... Go ahead, go okay. ahead but... <laughs> oh, and Julie also... <laughs> Julie didn't have any... She doesn't have any kids. So somebody, some woman in Colombia has to have 2 point or 4.2 children to reproduce what she didn't do, the workers that she didn't make. <laughs> and it's easy. She has dogs, though. You're they got right. it. <laughs> but it seems, it seems like it's logically like that, but con the countries are selecting who is going to replace them. Yeah. It's not like everybody is welcoming to replace the population and reproduce because we are we have this pyramid inverted. Yep. yep. Um, and th I think how that's are they doing that, Julie? Just what do you see when you say the countries are selecting who is going to replace people when there's a lower declining fertility rate? How are you saying they're doing that? How? Yeah, just just to be explicit. Yeah, through through visas, through requirements to enter in, in the country because if if people crossing the border here illegally let's yeah. say they can do the job i mean they already have the children and yeah. they can just bring four or, or five because they're doing it with children but that kind of immigrant is not allowed to be here because it's brown it's black it's coming from a poor country i don't know what's well, what's the well we have the idea if they're not educated and bringing resources see you and ricardo would be welcome here because you're educated and you're going to bring some resources so camilla would be welcome here because you're educated and you're going to bring some resources same with igor same with Bassam. But when you people have no resources, they're good to do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. That's really important. But we get enough of those people. We need people with more resources. Yeah. Uh, and let's say in my case, I could get um, um, citizenship or so to vote. Residency. Residence yeah. to vote. Yeah. Uh, how long will it take yeah, to me? For you, that would take 12 years probably. So, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait. I was just going to say that when you're tying immigration um, laws together with labor, right? Because now what you're talking yeah. about to fuel an economy is labor, right? And nations have friendlier immigration policies when yeah. they need more labor. 
especially yes. in this country. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what you're that's what you're spelling out. There's yeah. a direct correlation between friend, friendly immigration policies and the need for labor to fuel or run an economy. Exactly. And one thing that's happening here in the US is that we have um, labor laws that are supporting informal labor, right? So we want we kind of want there to be informal labor networks because it helps our economy to pay people less and to take exploit people and therefore fuel our economy and keep it running as the machine as we know mm -hmm. it. Thanks, DJ. Uh, you had that question. We, I have a, question. Um, Go ahead. Okay. okay, I have a, Bra a Brazilian example of what uh, Julie just said. It said uh, when we were in the uh, Juma administration, uh, she was uh, our president from 2010 until 2017, uh, she, they had a program called uh, More Doctors, Mais Médicos, and they bring uh, doctors, medical doctors from, uh, primarily from Cuba. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, in Brazil we have, uh, it's not that they don't have that much doctors, but uh, usually they don't want to go to small cities in yeah. interior country, stuff like that. And so the Juma have administration uh, have this program. And so Cubans uh, went to Brazil, the magic uh, doctors, and they were those uh, little cities and stuff like that. And when Bolsonaro, our last president, was in the office, he terminated the program and sent them back to Cuba. Okay? Because uh, arguing that they were spies. So we have uh, two examples here. First of all, the, the one that Julie just said, oh, what kind of immigrant I want? Yeah. I want doctors. So doctors, you can come here. Yeah? The ones that I uh, don't have to pay too much, actually. Was one of the critics, uh, critics uh, that they had about this program was that they don't pay as much as doctors would uh, receive uh, normally in Brazil. And the other thing that's uh, conspiracy theory. Oh, they are, they are Cubans and they are spies. They are not here to treat our population. They are here to uh, uh, change their mindsets for them to be communists. Whoa, yeah. so <laughs> let's, but what happened after that? Because uh, doctors, Brazilian doctors, were, were always critical about this, because they say, oh, they are stealing our jobs. Yeah. But what happened when the Cubans can go back to Cuba? No doctor wants to go to the places they, they were. Where the Cubans were. Yeah. yeah, but this is the problem. Here, two things, one I wanna, uh, this idea that Biden let Afghanistan fall so these Afghans could come, what we're talking about is like the people that Biden, that came after Biden, it's about 60,000 people, 60,000 Afghans. This is nothing. This is not going to sway. This wouldn't even change the election in state college. You know what I mean? Let alone the United States. But this is the thinking that divides human beings, okay? So we have two more questions. We have one from the stream and then G, G Doug, you wanna ask yours? Wait, oh wait, let's Tyler B is saying, how does the influx of people versus national growth affect overall prosperity of a nation? And the way it affects overall prosperity, this is somebody from the screen who's asking. Do you, do one of you wanna take it? You it. I should answer it? Yeah. It's, it it's that you, w unless, if you, you need the right balance of workers and of citizens and workers at every level of that pyramid. And the, the better the balance you have, you need more educated workers, less educated workers. You have people willing to work with their heads, people willing to work with their hands. And when all that comes together, then the nation is going to have an internal dynamic that can most lead to prosperity. But there are many factors involved of that. But definitely like, yeah. G. Yeah. So <coughs> you guys already like alluded into the question I was going to ask. I may have to change it up a bit. But I was I wanted to ask since you guys are talking a lot about how, the trend and how it's going to change through uh, with the immigration and the immigrants coming in. And this is like completely indifferent from like political motivation mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. all. 
I was just curious of how this affects our immediate surrounding rather than what is going to happen. Because an average person is not going to like look into like 10 years in the future of how the population is going to change and how our lifestyle is going to alter as a result. We want to know like what's going to happen now if all mm. these immigrants are, uh, are let in. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Bassam, do you have an, a re either Camilla or Bassam, one of you, Bassam, you've seen this in Iraq. You've seen what yeah. happens when so many new immigrants come in. I'm thinking yeah, I about can speak. I can speak for Iraq when we had an influx of Syrians. And uh, I used to go to like uh, a shopping mall. And most of them would be uh, people from Baghdad, uh, Erbil. Now I don't see anybody from these. All I see is Syrians. So... The Iraqis are out of business. They are jobless now, simply because they have been replaced by the Syrians who will work for less. Because the Syrians are, they came as refugees. They are refugees and, uh, and they don't need the amount of income that an Iraqi needs to sustain a family, a family with three kids in school, medical bills. Uh, rent, uh, gas for his car. The refugee, they live five, six people in one bedroom. Uh, because they have to. They have to. They are forced to. And then because of that, the idea for if you're a refugee, then it would be, well, listen, I'll, I would rather take $10 than to wait for a different job and make $100. Give me 10 because I'm hungry and I have nothing to eat. So I'll do what you're asking me for ten dollars, and so this is how the refugees undermine economy. Yeah, I I have a friend of mine who has a tailor shop, and he has been in Erbil for like twenty years, and he is also upset with the fl influx of Syrians. He said I'm losing business because a refugee will do the job that I do for like five dollars. He will do it for two. Yeah. So he's he's threatened too. So does that answer oh. your question? Is that like, like well, that's what people see, right? But, but I, I want to add one other thing that yeah. people see. So um, in a, a town, Bound Brook, New Jersey, if anybody knows it, but um, I grew up part of my life next to that town. And that town um, was, when I was growing up, a town that was mostly white people. And now it's primarily Latinos, um, people from Guatemala and Honduras, I think mostly. That town has been revitalized 100%. It was, shops were closing, nobody was doing anything in the downtown, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've seen is a rebirth of that town. Every, every storefront has, has businesses in it now that it didn't have before. So that's another thing yeah. that we see with immigrants who are ready to work and ready to build a life. So And need to work. And right. need, have to work, have to build a life. Yeah. So we see yeah. that as well. So, do you... I agree with Lori. Syrians, I'm not, I don't have anything against them. They are really hardworking. Uh, they are the best in restaurants. Oh, and really, Syrian really, the best. they yeah. are the best in doing yeah, yeah. really Syrian food. food. But go ahead. <laughs> so for me, I'm not affected by the influx of yeah. Syrians, but I'm enjoying them being there. Yeah. Really. You. But, it's, but you see the consequences for other folks. Uh, and could I add something when it comes? Yeah, we have one one minute. Oh, um, okay. So, I'm, so yeah, you know the dynamic changes because uh, when the um, Ukrainian refugees came at the beginning, shops were full of uh, aid that people were living. Everybody was helping. Right now, people are like, hmm, they started taking jobs, ah. but they started taking jobs that nobody wants anyway. So. Yeah, got you. But you don't see that. So what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking, when I think about the great, the, their great replacement theory here in the United States, and the more people start using this as an attack, as like this sort of, first, it just divides our politics here. Nobody trusts anybody. And then it divides us against people who are refugees. Yeah. Do you have any? I think I just want to ask us to ask ourselves when we hear the word conspiracy to wonder who's conspiracy and really what are the facts? What are what are the, because it's pretty complicated from what yeah. we were all talking about. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a conspiracy. No, it doesn't <laughs> sound like a conspiracy to me, actually. It just sounds like the inevitable reality of, of immigra immigrants coming from one place and not another. And dude, no one never asked a question. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if you want to see the uh, something similar happening in the history, uh, go see the history of the uh, Roman Empire. Oh. The barbarian invasions was th this. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's history repeating itself. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Huh. Hey, can we um, have a round of applause for uh, you all? Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. It's really, really, really an honor to have all four of you here. Bos we'll be back on uh, Thursday. Bossom will be back on Thursday. You'll all be back, but Bossom will be talking on Thursday. So, all right. Hey, is, and if anybody has a question or something, come, come down to the front by all means. Yeah. yeah.